You're listening to The Stressless Life with Dr. Yip, a podcast about conquering your fears and overcoming anxiety. The question for the day is, online dating, friend or foe for the anxious single person? I am your host, Noah Laracy. Let's say hello to Dr. Yip. Hi, Noah. Dr. Yip is a licensed psychologist who's board certified in behavioral and cognitive therapy and an expert in the treatment of anxiety and OCD. So last time we talked about dating anxiety, and today we're going to talk about dating online sites and dating apps and all that stuff. What about the social media, too? Social media, of course. Mm -hmm. So if I have social anxiety or dating anxiety and I want to meet someone, right, now I can just go online and meet someone and work on my profile. Isn't this a great thing? (laughs) You know, it's like a double-edged sword. It is great that the internet provides us with the medium to connect with more people. However, the question is, connect with them how? And the problem with a lot of the dating sites, especially today's dating sites, is that people are connecting not really to date, for se. They're connecting to hook up. And that's not good? (laughs) Well, I guess it depends on what your motive is and what your intention is, right? So if your intention is just to hook up, sure, you know, this is pretty much Christmas, Christmas morning. However, if your intention is to find that person that will develop into a more intimate relationship, Yeah, you know, those dating apps today like Tinder and Grindr and whatever else is out there, Snapchat, is really just for hooking up. Let's take this back a little bit because in in the beginning, right before the internet, you actually had to go and meet the person and call them and go on dates. So the idea of these sites were that there were a lot of people out there that are having trouble meeting people, right? Mm -hmm. So the sites catered to them and helped you get through that initial stage of actually trying to find someone. Sure. So that's a good thing, right? Yes. And that's what that's what the first generation dating sites did. So if you remember eHarmony and then later Match.com, the purpose of those sites was to connect you with all of the people that are available in your specific area. You know, you did searches by location. And you had a profile and you had to see whether, well, does this person seem like someone who might be interested in? And then you'd message them and then you'll see if they message you back. You know, I remember there are ways that you can connect with them. And in today's world, you pretty much bypass all of that. It's almost like, you know, the remote control where you can forward or you can just skip to the next scene. Well, people are just skipping to the next scene and bypassing all of the process of dating. When those sites first started, I think there was a little bit of a stigma around using them. Whereas now that is absolutely not the case. Everyone's using them. They're very, very mainstream, right? Sure. And once that sort of went away, the, the, the apps came onto the scene. So that you could then meet someone, talk to them, and make any sort of arrangement you wanted to make without ever even having to really engage with them whatsoever. Yes, that's what's happening with our generation today (laughs) is you're swiping left if you aren't interested and you're swiping right if you are interested. And if it's a match, well, then you guys can hook up. So there might be some people, I don't know who they might be, who'd say, well, that sounds pretty good, right? Yes, That is true. There are a lot of people who are saying, yes, that's pretty good. Especially a lot of the the boys out there are saying, yes, that's awesome. However, you have to take into consideration what is this doing to our brain long term? What is it conditioning us long term? You know, back in the old days, if you wanted to date somebody, you went on a date, you, you took the emotional risk to see if they even want to go on a date with you. Then you went on a date to see if there is a connection and then they go home And then over time, you work up to having that intimacy, right? Whether that is having sex without intimacy or making love with intimacy. The thing is that the sex 
was the reward. And therefore, it conditioned us to go through the process of dating. And it conditioned men to go through the process of dating. Today, we're just handing out sex on the platter. And we're just giving it away. Like, like it's nothing. Like, there's no value. And, you know, I don't see myself as a traditional person. Though, that sounds like a free-for-all. Right. So if you are not valuing your body, if you're not valuing the experience of intimacy, then why would the other recipient value it as well? So it's almost like you're training your partner to think a certain way when you reward him for certain types of behaviors. Well, I don't want this to be a gender bias, right? Because there are men out there who want a relationship rather than just hooking up as well. So this goes both ways, even though by nature, yes, if we're even to take biology into consideration, right? The whole point of the male species dating is to spread his seed to as many potential eggs as possible. And the purpose of females dating, again, is to ensure their genes will survive through someone who can protect and provide. And therefore, because females have only one egg a month, and when you're pregnant, it's a good nine months, and raising a child is a lot of time, women choose the the partner whom will be most likely to protect and provide. However, today, we're not following that with the apps because all we're doing is we're, again, handing out sex on a platter like it is worthless. Sounds like you're saying that men and women have different evolutionary strategies, but that these apps are somehow distorting those. Definitely. And then you have to question the women today who are using the apps. Are they using the apps to fulfill a need, to fulfill an emptiness, to fulfill a gap? Are they just using the apps because everyone is doing it? Because, well, if you want to get together with a man, this is the only way. And if that is the reason why you're using the app, then you might want to reconsider. Let's talk about how the apps, in some ways, they're a form of avoidance, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. It's a form of avoidance of rejection, of being rejected by a potential mate. And it's a form of rejection because you're able to kind of spread out the whole process to a point where you never actually feel a moment of rejection? That's right. You you don't feel a moment of rejection. Let's take Tinder, for example, right? This is the app that everyone's using today. You swipe, and if there's a match, excellent. You have that two second to see if you want to respond. If you don't respond, well, let's keep it moving. There are many fish in the sea. So therefore, the experience of rejection is no longer present. The problem with that is that it is inhibiting people's tolerance and ability to experience negative emotions. It's basically like pharmaceutical companies, right? You don't like this feeling? There's a pill for it. In the dating world, well, you don't like rejection? There's an app for it. And how does that help the human race evolve? So it sounds like you're saying that the app allows you to not feel rejection. And the very reason that people like it is actually the reason why it's doing so much damage. Yes, Inherently, that's what's happening. So it'd be healthier to actually go out and be rejected a number of times than to go onto Tinder and kind of quasi be rejected by not being swiped. Yes. You know, the, the thing is, it's not just dating apps. It's social media in general. What's happening today is we are breeding this current generation to be narcissistic. And we're breeding them to be narcissistic because there's no longer that interpersonal face-to-face -face connection, 
what we're telling them is, or what we're implying to them, is that in order to connect, you have to be on social media. You have to post everything there is to post about yourself, what you're having for dinner, who you're hanging out with, what your pets are doing, what your children are doing, every little thing about your life, and people like them. Right? We can say that's true for any social media, whether it's Twitter or Instagram or or Facebook. How many people like you? How many people follow you? Is basically the determinant of whether you're accepted or not. And what's also happening is that people are just being gratified instantly. So what is this breeding? This is breeding a whole generation. Of kids who need instant gratification, who cannot delay being gratified all the time, so they're becoming these narcissistic adults with the only intention of me, 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 me. Look at me, look at me, look at me. See how wonderful I am. Me, 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 me. And it's all about me. So again, with the addiction to social media, especially with the current apps and dating, we are just breeding a generation of narcissistic people who need instant gratification. Sounds like they don't develop a sense of resiliency because they never have obstacles and discomfort that they need to overcome. Yes, but some parents would probably say, "I suffered a lot." I don't want my kids to、oh, go、geez. through to have to, to go <laughs> have to experience any discomfort. Oh yeah, don't let me get started on that topic now. Okay, so we've come to this generation where parents want to be their kids' best friend, where parents are no longer parenting. They have a term for helicopter parents, right? Parents who are basically determining what their kids are doing at all times, and therefore kids never really make any decisions for themselves. And then when they go off to college and after college, and when these kids have a hard time to thrive in the real world, parents wonder, well, why? What happened? Well, if you're going to keep A kid from making his or her own decision, from being able to think for themselves, then why would you expect that child to be able to think for themselves or make his or her own decision later on in adult life when it's absolutely necessary? The other thing that's happening is that we have a generation of people who. No longer has the confidence that they would have, and this problem comes from the whole idea that every single child deserves a star. Where in the world did that idea come from, and who in the world thought that up? Every single child deserves a star. So basically, the child believes I don't have to do dilly squat, and I am special because I got a star for doing nothing. So what we're breeding here are kids who are expecting their sense of entitlement, expecting to be liked, to be deserving of the world's affection, without having done anything, without having achieved anything. So again, it's a paradigm problem. It's a systemic problem. And yes, it starts from how we parent our children, how the school formulate. Kids in a structured environment, and then what social media does to our kids. Then down the road, what these apps are doing to dating for these kids in their young adult life. Wow. <laughs>、uh, for these dating apps, what role does anxiety? Play. There、checking. is no role for anxiety with these apps because there's no room. You don't need to feel anxious. You don't need to feel anxious about being rejected, being disliked. Because hey, you don't even get to see whether you're rejected or not. You get to see whether you're a match, and if you're not, well, you never see the people who rejected you because there are just millions that you're going through. I think that's what I was getting at: is the apps they almost seem to be constructed and made to make them as anxiety-free as possible, or to sort of hide the anxiety behind the wall of cyberspace. Yes, right. So you never actually know what the person out there who is swiping. 
I don't know which which side is which side is reje- <laughs> whatever side is rejection. You never get to see that. You yes. never get to right. Mm-hmm. So you never actually get to feel that pain. No. But at the same time, by not experiencing that pain, you never get the experience of being able to walk through it and overcome it. Exactly. And remember, last week we talked about you have to practice rejection in order to be able to tolerate rejection. Because the reality is, whether we're talking about dating, or we're talking about a job opportunity, or we're talking about your friends, or your family, acceptance and rejection is a real part of life. And for every rejection that you experience, if you're just going to go hide in a hole and hide from the world through social media, then you're not a very resilient person. And yes, the dating world is pretty much the easiest place to experience rejection, though there's rejection in all areas of life. If your boss criticizes you, what are you going to do? Swipe left? Do you hear what I'm saying? So you have to be able to tolerate rejection. And the only way to build that resiliency is to actually put yourself out there, actually allow yourself to feel the emotional vulnerability. And then if you experience a rejection, great, you've got one experience down your belt. Now go out there and get some more of that. How is this millennial generation, how have they shown up in your practice? Specific cases of people coming in here who maybe were raised by these type of parents and are unable to experience rejection. How does it actually sort of show up in their lives? And what, in other words, what happens to them once they get into the quote unquote real world? It goes much further than just social anxiety. I have kids as well as young adults that I work with at the Renewed Freedom Center where they aren't able to make any decisions for their own lives. They feel incapable of making decisions for fear of making the wrong decision because they've never really experienced failure in their lives because their parents have always stepped in to make sure that everything will go fine accordingly. And therefore, if you've never experienced failure, if you've never experienced rejection, then of course you're going to be afraid of it. You know, it's like that quote from Edison, I didn't fail a hundred times. I just figured out a hundred different ways why it won't work. And that's what we're trying to foster the sense that, you know, you need to experience mistakes in order to learn from them, in order to know what works and what doesn't work. So if these kids have never experienced what doesn't work, how will they know what will work? So you have a bunch of these kids who basically experiences a failure to thrive. You know, there's that whole movie about it. And they're in their early adulthood. Maybe they've just finished college. Maybe they're still in high school and they can't step forward. And then you have parents who are flabbergasted because they don't understand why. Well, it is important to let kids experience the real trials and tribulations of life because how else are they going to learn okay so for dating yes back to dating back to dating what would you suggest that a young single person do you're saying they actually should just go out and just ask people out on dates and try to just delete all your apps i would say delete all the apps yes definitely the problem with the dating world is that it can be a game However, just because it can be a game, it doesn't mean that you need to play that game. If you don't want to play the game, then don't. If you do end up playing that game, then what you're doing is you're condoning that game and saying that it's okay. It's the same as if you don't want to just have sex, then don't. However, if you do, you can't blame the game or dating that, well, if you don't put out, you don't get a date. Well, that's absolutely not true. When you do put out, what you're basically saying is, you know, it doesn't mean that much to me. So here, take it. And again, it's almost like we've gone this backward route where back in the days, We had to go through the dating and the intimacy built from the dating. And then the sex was the ultimate reward. Today, that's not true. There is no reward to dating. What is the reward? 
What's the reward? It's a good point. I guess that the sex comes earlier, so that's the reward. I guess you're saying here that the sex comes first. The first sex right? definitely comes right. first. So at that point, there's really not a whole lot of motivation to go through all the work of getting to know the person or that all that intimacy stuff, right? Because yes. you've already got what you you know you've already got what you want. Sure. And if that is what you're into, and you are honest about it, then great, fine, go for it. However, if you're doing it yet deep down inside you really are looking for an intimate relationship an interpersonal relationship then perhaps you need to reconsider the strategies that you're using because what is happening is a lot of people are just hiding behind social media to feel connected yet they're really not connected they're addicted to the devices so delete those apps kids that's all the time we have for today Thank you for listening to the Stressless Life podcast. You can join the discussion and find more information at www.dryip.com slash the stressless life. Please write to us with questions and comments at the stressless life at Until next time, stay stressless. Stress less.